One. You will hear the introduction to a lecture on consumer habits. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Good evening, everyone. This evening, I'm going to continue last week's lecture by talking more about how people spend their money. First of all, I'm going to compare how people of different age groups spend their cash. You probably know that there's a lot of difference between what young people do with their money, how families spend their money, and what more mature people do. Secondly, I want us to think about what we imagine men and women spend their money on, and then I'm going to look at male and female spending patterns and see whether we were right. Okay, to start with, let's divide the population into three sections. Let's say、uh, young people up to the age of thirty in the first group. Then、um, let's put families in the thirty to fifty-five-year-old group. So that puts adults over fifty-five in the mature group. Does that make sense? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. Right. Well, I found that the first group, that's young people up to the age of thirty, mostly spend their money on clothes, music, and entertainment. That's not really very surprising, is it? Although I must admit, I thought they might spend a lot on cars and travelling around. So. The next group is what I've called families, people in the age group from thirty to fifty-five. Naturally, as I expected, this group spends most of its money on food, toys, and trips out. But I was surprised to find that people aged between thirty and fifty-five spend most of their money on furniture and kitchen equipment. I suppose it's logical if you think about it. People are usually improving their homes at that age. And household equipment is very expensive, but they also spend a lot of money on electronic equipment like video games for the children. Now turning to the third group, that's people over fifty-five. I thought they'd spend their money on gardening tools and electronic equipment, but I was wrong again. People in the over fifty-fives group spend most money on new cars and days out. So. What did we think about how men and women spend their money? Okay, well, we thought that young women would spend a lot on clothes and shoes, and that young men would buy more electronic equipment and cars. Well, when we look at the figures, we can see that we were right about the men. Young men spend twice as much as women on cars and computers, but, and this is interesting, we were wrong about the women. I was surprised to find that young women spend much more on beauty treatments than they do on clothes and shoes. So we'll have to think about that again. And there's another interesting fact about young women. It looks as though young women are much more concerned about their diet than men. We found that although young women don't spend as much as men on eating out, they do spend a lot more on organic foods than young men. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a conversation about a language course. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Peterson, John Peterson. Could you spell that for me, please, Mr. Peterson? P, E, double T, E R, double S O N. That's a double T and a double S. Am I right? That's right. Now, could I ask you where the course takes place? Well, we offer courses in Hamburg and Berlin. For your level, there's never a problem. There are always plenty of people for the intermediate classes. Oh dear, does that mean that there might be a lot of students in my class? I wouldn't be very happy about that. No, don't worry, Mr. Peterson. The maximum class size is twelve, but I've never known there to be more than nine or ten in a class. It could even be five or six. Good. Actually, I'd prefer to study in Berlin. And how long is the course? Three weeks, five hours a day, two hours only on Saturday, Sundays free. I see. And what about accommodation? There you have a choice, Mr. Peterson. You can either stay with a German family who are used to having such guests. Or you can stay on the university campus, or we can book you into a nearby bed and breakfast. Is there a big difference in price? Not really. Staying with the family works out the cheapest, and the bed and breakfast is a bit more money. Staying on the university campus comes somewhere between the two price-wise, but Berlin is not too expensive anyway. Which do you recommend? Well, if you want to practice your German and be part of a German family, I would recommend staying with a family. Our families are all hand-picked, and we've never had any sort of complaint. Yes, I'll probably do that then. What are the dates of the course? The first summer course starts on the first of June in Hamburg, and a week later in Berlin. Which is what would concern you, as you have chosen the Berlin course. That's the eighth of June. The next course would begin on the second of July, and then the second of July course would be perfect for me. Can you put me down for it now? Certainly, Mr. Peterson. Can I have your address, please? Twenty-six, Mayfield Drive, Orpington, Kent. I'm afraid I can't remember the postal code. Don't worry, Mr. Peterson. I'll check on it. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. There are a couple of other things I'd like to ask. Certainly. What do I need to bring on the course? Well, apart from the obvious, you'll need our textbooks. I'll email you the name and publisher. You should be able to find it in your local bookstore. If you do have problems, call me or email me, and I'll see what I can do. We provide the computers, computer discs, translation exercises, and all that sort of thing, but you will need a good dictionary. We recommend Langenscheidt, which is more than adequate for your level. 
you don't have to go and spend a lot of money on an expensive dictionary. Not yet, anyway. Maybe you will when your German reaches a very high standard. That would be very nice. <laughs> Now, finally, what about the cost of the course, and how do I pay? Would you like to pay that in pounds or in euros? Euros would be fine. In that case, it's five hundred and fifty euros. You can pay by credit card if you like. Oh dear, I'm afraid I haven't got a credit card. How else can I pay? That's not a problem, Mr. Pettersen. You can pay by bank transfer. Fine. By the way, I forgot to mention I am a full-time student. Have you got a student card? Oh yes. Then that does make a difference. You'll be pleased to hear. You are entitled to thirty-five percent off the full price, and if you can persuade a few people to join you, it would work out even cheaper. How do you mean exactly? Well, for every five people you find, one goes free. In other words, if there are six of you, you get one free course. Of course, in reality, you would divide up the savings amongst you, presumably. Right. Well, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Thank you. Not at all, Mr. Pettersen, and I'm sure you'll enjoy the course. There are, of course, sightseeing possibilities. Would you like me to send you our brochure describing them? Yes, thank you. I'd appreciate that. Anyway, thanks for your help. If I want to call back, who do I ask for? Susanna, I'm here most of the time. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a lecture. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. I'd like to introduce Rebecca Bramwell, an artist and illustrator, who has come along today to talk to you all about getting your first job or commission as an artist. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you for inviting me. I remember when I graduated back in nineteen eighty-three. I was very excited about getting my first commission. My degree was in fine art, and I'd worked long and hard to get it. I was an enthusiastic student, and I never found it difficult to find the incentive to paint. I think as a student. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a lecture about staying healthy in university. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-three to forty. London being settled by the Romans explains their lust for blood. By about A.D. 200, the administration of Britain was divided in two. York became the capital of Britannia Inferior, and London of Britannia Superior. Around the same time, the city also acquired its famous walls, probably about twenty foot high. Why did they build such high walls? It was a protective measure, which may have been due to civil war, initiated when Governor Claudius Albinus tried to claim the imperial crown in Rome. Was paganism still predominant then? Yes, but Christianity appears to have reached the province at an early date, and only a year after the religion became officially tolerated in the empire, London had its own bishop. 
Restitutus, who is known to have attended the Imperial Council of Al. You really delve deep. I think you'll do well on your tutorial paper. Good luck, David. Thanks. Good morning, all. Welcome to our regular lecture on health issues. This series of lectures is organised by the Students' Union and is part of an attempt to help you stay healthy while coping with study and social life at the same time. It's a great pleasure to welcome back Ms. Mary Kirk, who is a professional health advisor and physical education officer. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be back. Today we're going to discuss the benefits of exercise. University life is hectic and stressful. It also involves a lot of sedentary work, that is, sitting for many hours at a time. What I'd like to focus on is how to approach exercise, not only from the aspect of health benefits, but also as a form of stress relief. I know it's hard to organise your time around studies and socialising. But you can socialise while exercising. If you have an hour free in the morning, afternoon, or evening, it would be a good idea to get together with your friends and create a sports team. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. The grounds of the university are ample enough to support every student's need to become active. There are also readily available facilities at your disposal, such as a football field, tennis, and badminton courts. There's also a swimming centre, and within that building is a gymnasium. With a variety of programs such as aerobics and weight training, if the idea of attending one of these facilities seems daunting, then you can walk along the river. Oh, and that reminds me, the university also offers rowing. If there is a sport that you're interested in that's not on offer, you can approach either your student union representative or speak with sports administration manager, Mr. Lawrence Cavendish. Now I want to talk about why exercise is beneficial physically and emotionally. The obvious results are physical. You can keep fit by using muscles that ordinarily don't get used in the classroom. The health benefits are astronomical. You'll live longer, be happier, and look good. By building muscle, you strengthen your bones, a definite advantage for women in their later stages of life. As women are prone to osteoporosis, it also strengthens your heart. Yes, don't forget your heart is a muscle, and the more exercise you do and the harder you work, the more blood is pumped from your heart to your brain. Now this brings me to the psychological advantages of exercise. When we are active, endorphins are released into our brain. An endorphin is a chemical that is released when your heart rate is pumping beyond its normal capacity. It's the same as adrenaline. You can actually feel when endorphins kick in. You feel a rush, almost a high. The benefits of this are numerous. Your brain works at peak capacity for a longer period of time. Your awareness is maximized, and the fatigue you usually feel at four o'clock in the afternoon. Will be non-existent. In one word, exercise makes you sharp. Now, I'm not saying that you should overdo exercise, because too much of anything can be dangerous. But if you think about your daily routine, you spend about six hours a day in lectures and another two or more hours studying. That's a long time to be sitting, and that is a long time for your body not to be moving around. So try and find at least one hour a day to get some exercise. If you can't fit in one hour a day, 
Try one hour every second day or half an hour a day. You will see rewards instantly. You'll feel great and look great. This I can promise you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear an interview about why conservation groups, such as Greenpeace, are interested in protecting whales. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. We hear a lot these days about whales and the need to protect them. But when did this interest start? Because people have been hunting whales for centuries, haven't they? Yes, for at least a thousand years. And there were no problems until this century, really. What happened was that fishing technology became much more efficient and the ships were much faster, so more and more whales were caught. In the 1960s, the main whaling countries were killing more than 60,000 whales a year and I think everyone began to realise that something had to be done. When did the killing begin to slow down? It was quite a slow process and it was the environmental groups like Greenpeace that really made things change. I mean, they set out to make people aware of the fact that whales were fast becoming extinct. But even now, we don't know if this interest has come too late. If you take the great blue whale, for example, which at 30 or 40 metres long is the biggest animal there has ever been, now there are perhaps about 2,000 or so left. In fact, they have been protected for quite a long time, but there is still no sign that their population is growing. Am I right in thinking that killing whales is against the law? Yes. In fact, there was an international agreement to stop killing whales, but there are three countries which still catch whales, and they are Iceland, Norway and Japan. In fact, under the international agreement, they are allowed to catch whales for scientific research and they use this as an excuse to carry on as they did before. What do they use the whale for? In Japan, it's quite a popular kind of food, and it's very traditional. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.